Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have Drew D'Agostino, who is the founder of Crystal Knows, or is it just Crystal now? Is it Crystal or Crystal Knows? I've seen both, man. It's Crystal, but honestly, we probably just roll with Crystal Knows. It was, it was one okay. of those cases where you like, that was the domain that was available, and it kind of just became the name of the company. So, Okay, well, we'll just roll with it. Yeah. Um, so the company helps people communicate more effectively with each other by developing personality detection software and email assistance tools. He's been named to Forbes 20, or I should say it was in 2020, he was named to Forbes 30 under 30 list in enterprise technology. Drew, welcome. Happy to have you on the show, man. Thanks. Appreciate it, Ryan. Yeah, dude. I, I usually don't ask people a question in the middle of the intro, so sorry about that. Totally random, just stream of consciousness because I'm like, wait, I see Crystal knows all the time, right? So, well, yeah, uh, you don't really, you're, you also don't want me. To, I usually don't refer to the thirty under thirty thing because that, that's that's I don't think that's no longer. <laughs> right now, that's more of a red flag than anything. <laughs> well, hey, you're doing good. You've been, you know, your company's eight and a half years old ish, right? A little bit older than that. So, you've you've demonstrated the staying power and made it happen. So, real quick, let's do a revenue rundown just so everybody has some context in terms of where you're at and stages of the journey. So, so Drew, where are you guys at in terms of your ARR? Oh, we're coming up on five million. Yeah, okay, right. awesome. And then, what's your primary revenue grow to market strategy? About seventy five percent B two B, and that's that's broken up between mid market and enterprise. And twenty five percent of our revenue still comes from our like B two C channel, which you could call it PLG, B two C PLG okay. self service, whatever you want to call it. People paying us with a credit card. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and so then from there, I guess, like, walk us through what your solution does and who it serves and, and how it kind of works. And I don't know, like a paragraph or so, if you will, three, four sentences, a verbal, a verbal paragraph, a verbal paragraph. Yeah. Well, sometimes here, here's, yeah. here's why I'm giving you context. I'll ask people that question and they'll talk about it for 20 minutes. I'm like, dude, we just went through the whole episode on your product. So, so <laughs> give me a verbal paragraph, if you will, on that. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, so Crystal is, it's founded on the fundamental truth that people have personality differences. And those are very strong and observable and measurable. Um, so if you, if you believe that, which most people do, that's where kind of Crystal can step in and solve a problem. Because when people have these differences between each other, it results in communication being kind of difficult. So if you're a very detail-oriented person and you've worked with someone who's super at the high level and does not want to hear about the details, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so Crystal builds tools to reconcile those differences between people. And we do that in like meetings, calls, um, most recently building tools like our writing assistant, uh, it's writing assistant to help you write better emails to people who are, um, different personality types than you. And, um, yeah, most, and mostly it's, it's used by a lot of different types of people and organizations, but our, uh, our ideal customer these days is a B2B sales organizations. So that's Crystal in, in the verbal paragraph. <laughs> you did a good job, man. You didn't go over. So awesome work on that. How big is your team right now? Uh, we are 30 and change. 30 and change. Okay, cool. And then, you know, are, are you bootstrapped or funded? Uh, we, we raised capital a while ago. We haven't since early 2018. Um, so since then, so like Crystal's been kind of a bootstrap. We've had a bootstrapped P&L with the venture back balance sheet. And it's only like really up to recently where we started really deploying the capital. So it's been a long time kind of functioning in bootstrap mode because it took us a while to really find like a, you know, really figure out what the product was in product market fit. So we've been pretty lean. So that's interesting, man. Like, cause you don't often hear that. So it sounds like you got the, the money or the investment and then took a slow approach versus the hard charging, you know, burn, burn a lot, burn fast. Right. And, and then you sounds like just read between the lines, wanted to really make sure you nailed the product market fit before you kind of start pouring gas on it. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's partially there. Um, I did not strat do that, pursue that strategy right out the gate. I actually hired a bunch right after we raised the round about three or four months went by and I realized it just was, this was not the right time. We had not yet found it. So I actually had to make some pretty tough like decisions had like a layoff and, um, that was in 2018. So out of the gate after that last round of funding, basically tried to start building and realized, nope, this is not going to work. So rather than put the put my company in jeopardy, I had to make some decisions and like get us a little course corrected. Stabilized. Okay. Yeah. Now the thing is, since then, 
it's been a series of like four or five course corrections, but doing so with a much leaner team and like a much more nimble business model so that we could. Um, it wasn't until 2020 that we really figured out the B2B sales motion. So since then, that it was like pretty much 0% of our business was coming from large team accounts. It was like all really? PNG. Yeah. And then we started hiring sales team, started hiring customer success. And gradually over the last uh, two and a half years, that part of the business has grown from like 0% to about 75% of the business. So we've wow. been building, a, I call it kind of like a two and a half year old business on an eight year old product. Um, now doing a lot of product work and then enhancing and building new features and stuff. But at the core of it, it's like, it's a very similar value proposition, except sold in a very different way. So um, yeah, that that's kind of been the reasoning. And we, because we wanted to make sure we didn't, burn our capital and need to raise while the company was in a vulnerable position of, you know, not having figured out the business model yet. Um, we now have figured out a business model and we're still paying down the price. Or we're still paying down some of the debt we accrued, meaning like technical debt, product debt, customer debt of like basically being in the wrong markets throughout several points over the last few years. So now the last year I called it, taking the medicine year, like I kept reiterating that take, take the medicine, had to pay down a lot of tech debt, had to um, really restructure our organization to get ready to scale and really focus in on this like ICP of sales orgs. So we took the medicine this year, we're trying to build organizational maturity. Um, so just really start to build um, the sale, the go to market motion into a more of a well-oiled machine, which we're still not, we, we, we still are a little bit wild west out there. But we're figuring it out as we go. So, yeah. Well, it, yeah. I mean, like, uh, there's so many different stages that companies go through. So, and thanks for being candid about it because there's, there's a lot of areas we could dig into here. But what would you say is like your single biggest challenge with with creating that well oiled go to market machine in terms of like moving up market and and really really expanding that the the, the customer base in terms of that perspective. I could describe it as the sales funnel itself, like stage by stage. So we, we don't have the typical problems of, of a lot of earlier stage companies. Like top of funnel is not a problem for us. We, we really get a lot of inbound interest. We've had a really consistent like twenty to 25,000 new users per month for years who come in. And of those, there's a lot of them who are qualified. Definitely not all. Most of them are not really qualified to be like a B2B account. But there's a lot of good leads in there. So our, our process is about like taking those use that user base trying to filter it out and identify product qualified leads sales qualified leads who like actually raise their hand and then like marketing qualified leads who participate in you know webinars and content and all that stuff so the top of funnel is really strong with crystal but where where we have historically struggled the most with um is the middle of funnel because we also have a pretty good win rate relative once once we're we're in demos and we're kind of at that stage where it's a qualified opportunity we have a pretty good win rate because it's, it's not very competitive in our market yet um but that middle of funnel where it's taking that raw interest from a big pool of potential leads and then allocating our sales teams time well to, to basically make sure they're focusing on the really well qualified ops that they can have um, a, bit, like a pricing structure that works really well. And it's a very educational sales process because a lot of the times we're not replacing an existing solution where we're bringing in a new idea. That's, that's where we've, historically had the most trouble and honestly it's still that's that's our biggest area of focus it's like how do we speed up the time from a customer being like kind of interested to being a legitimate opportunity um that's my biggest challenge at the moment okay i can see that well and, and a lot of companies struggle with that so i mean it's good that you got the top of funnel just it sounds like nailed and when you say 20 to twenty five thousand a month you're talking like free users that come in yeah correct? free users yeah okay and then like of those, so if, if you got, I mean, that's, that's a massive pool, right? Of, of individual users. What's the typical conversion rate uh, that you look for with that? And then um, we'd just love to get your take on that. Well, it's hard to measure a conversion rate off a number that big because some of those will, some of those will come down into like their own self-service accounts. And then that's okay. even just when you sign up for a self-service paid account, we only have annual. So it's like $588 a year. You kind of qualify yourself as a lead at that point. We, we treat our B2C tool as a self-service funnel on its own. So you know, we'll get we'll get somewhere around uh, 
call it like a 5% conversion of those free users to like those kind of paid accounts. I think that, no, what am I talking about? That's not 5%. Sorry, I'm doing math in my head, new public math, 0.5% conversion. I was like, no, that would be insane if we got that. More like a 0.5% conversion to, to, the, uh, to the, the paid accounts. And then we'll probably get a um, another 0.5 to 1% who are bona fide like SQLs, hand raisers, mm -hmm. request for price quotes, get into the funnel. And then the, on top of that is a pretty big layer of what we call PQLs or product qualified leads where that's usually in the neighborhood of like 10% of those who we can identify as like, all right, for whatever reason, whether it's product usage data or enriched data, like where the company they're from or, or job title, you'll get like 10% of those signups will we'll filter out that we want to focus on as product qualified leads. So okay. that's gotcha. what the funnel, that's kind of what the funnel looks like right now. That's cool, man. So is it, cause like, and, I, and I'd be curious on what your take is. Cause I, I, I work with founders on this all the time. So for that middle part, is the hardest part of a reason why people aren't acting now in terms of the speed? Is it because they don't understand the tangible outcomes that your solution delivers? Or is it- uh, Crystal, is a, a, Crystal is a unique product and then it's so often, it's like the, the outcome is in the eye of the beholder where certain people are coming into Crystal looking for a new sales tool. It's like, hey, I wanna optimize my conversion rate and, and this seems like a clever way to use AI to do that. And it's like, you know, basically trying to try to increase some, some sales metric. Some people come to crystal and it's like, I just really love disc and I'm a leader who's trying to implement disc in my company. This is a great way to implement it on the sales team and recruiting and on just how we manage people. So give me the whole thing. I want, I want it's very, just is very disc oriented to sale. we love those people because you don't have to sell them on the idea. You just have to prove that you can execute on the strategy. Um, there's some people coming to Crystal looking at it for entire internal communication. So there's like massive companies use Crystal just for internal communication and not really? with their okay, customers. Cool. Um, so the, the, one of the challenges is that if you ask 10 people, 10 random users, why they came to Crystal and why they're interested, they'll generally give you like 10 different answers. <laughs> so that's a, that is historically for a year has been the biggest challenge. Um, so if you gave me at this point, a customer who's got a use case, I, I, as someone who's seen all of this, can hop on and, and explain how this is applied. But that comes from like years of me talking to these people over and over again. When you're, when you're trying to create a sales process that's repeatable and you can hire into and, and just make that a, uh, make it yeah, scalable, it's a hard thing because you need processes and you need a good template and you need a, a, a good, you know, step-by-step -step instructions. Um, so we struggled with that, but we're getting better. So it's a journey, man. Uh, especially if you have that many different use cases. Uh, and like, I, I can see it. I mean, like, like I was telling you in the pre-show, like I know I understand disc, like the back of my hand. So mm -hmm. uh, I could see how people could, could want to use it internally. Cause that's the way we use it back then before we knew you guys existed. And, um, but I've seen it on the sales side too, right? Mm -hmm. I was highly applicable. So let's talk, like, I want to talk about the product market fit then, man. Cause the point that you said, like, hey, we got the funding, I tried to do a bunch of hiring, and then I pulled back because you saw it wasn't there. I guess, what are the single biggest indicators that you saw that made you understand, like, we are not there with product market fit? It was a while ago. So this, was, this is like five years ago, so I'll have to remember. Um, but essentially, it, uh, it, was, it was pretty clear that we didn't have an audience. Like, our audience is just so broad that mm. when you're trying to speak to everybody, you, you're, you're really speaking to no one. Um, so kind of just jamming in, you know, sales leadership and um, marketing resources into this broad kind of nebulous market. I just saw it in the numbers. I'm like, this is just actually, we haven't, we're not able to really close any deals. Um, I think I just, you know, I, I definitely had this idea that if you just plug in, you know, people to these roles, they'll kind of figure it, <laughs> figure it out, even though I haven't really figured out how to sell it myself. I'm like, oh, I'll get people to do it. And I've realized, no, I've probably figured out how to sell this thing myself um, before I ask, you know, people to be like a silver bullet. Um, so I don't really remember specifically if it was like, hey, this metric's not working. It's more just like pretty obvious that like we're not ready for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Product wasn't ready. 
the market really wasn't ready. Um, the market is just coming around to the idea of like using predictive models and stuff in the sales process. And now it's all accelerating a lot with like generative AI, but you talk about crystal being like an AI company back then. It's like AI is kind of like, all right, whatever. Yeah, the, this is, this is like a boo boo, um, kind of a buzzword that I hear at conferences, but it's not real. Um, so yeah, I think it's everything just wasn't ready. We were pretty early. Okay. Gotcha. So I guess like, let's shift gears. Like, I mean, what do you see working really well now? Like what, what do you think is the single best strategy you have for growing your business right now? If you had identified, hmm. I think we've done a couple things really well recently uh, and some not, not so recently. So investing in our SEO funnel was a decision we made in like 2019. And that's become a massive traffic funnel. We identified some opportunities to just build up in this like personality space. And now Crystal is like one of the top personality tests you can find. And that was built from scratch in 20, 2019. Um, that contributes lots of new users. And even those lower conversion rate, because you get a lot of consumer type users in, we still get a lot mm -hmm. of businesses that come into the SEO funnel. So investing in SEO early on was a, was a good decision. Um, I think we did it particularly well. Um, I also think we, I think at the core, the, the thing that makes Crystal unique, and I used to think it was a bad thing, but now I'm realizing it's a strength, is that Crystal is a, um, it is a very right-brained software product. It's like an emotional, it's, it's an emotional SaaS tool. It's very strange because most, <laughs> most companies in our space like, you know, sales enablement or whatever you want to call it, like sales enablement, um, just in general, SaaS in general. If you think about it, it's all very like left brain type stuff. It's, this is how we make your processes more efficient. This is what software is for. Software takes process, it automates it and it makes it quicker, easier, cheaper, lower risk. Like that, that's what software is designed to do. And from the start, it's just not really crystal. Crystal actually makes you a little bit less efficient, um, but it, it hopefully makes you better it makes you better at communicating um so that's been something to figure out i think we've we've done that really well like maintaining the human side of crystal that mm -hmm. that captures people's imagination um and that's something that's been really important to me to maintain like whenever it it, it is the it is the lifeblood of our inbound funnel like the fact that crystal keeps going mini viral over and over and over again at companies um so i think a lot of that has to do with like the human component of crystal and i think that will last and that will persist um, so th yeah, that's, that's something that, again, it's not like recent, but it's, it's, it's deeply in our DNA, like having a SaaS tool that connects with people on an emotional level. Um, something that I, I don't know how it applies to other markets. Cause ours is kind of inherently like that with personality data, but I think it could be, um, I don't know. I haven't started a company in a while, so I am interested to see if it would translate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I guess like one of the things that I'm trying to think through is like for you, and, and I know this personally because I've experienced, but I'm curious because you have so much more data, uh, at least around this space than 99.9% than of, of companies out there, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so I guess my question for you is like, what would you say is like the single best business outcome that your solutions created for a sales team? Like, and at what stage of the process is it? Because I, I have like an example I could give you that I've seen it work really well. So like, I'm a believer because I, I know, especially for larger deals, um, how this, how big of an impact this has, but I'd be curious on your, on your take is like, what's the single biggest impact you've seen on the business side for this, for a sales team? Like one of our customers? Yeah. Um, I think there's that we, we get a lot of stories. So single biggest impact. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that happens. That I don't know about, but, um, I just, I just had, just recorded an interview with um, one of our new partners in the UK and he was explaining a story about how um, I think he, one of his clients was in a pitch, like a first big pitch meeting with a, it was in PR and it was like a big PR pitch meeting. And there's, it's on LinkedIn. There's this, it's like a little 90 second video clip of him explaining this and pretty much using crystal in it and before the meeting and really emphasizing you know, who's like the skeptic in the room and who's the, who's the people we really need to be assertive with and all those things. They really emphasized it because he was working with her as a client at the time. And apparently it like launched our whole 
her whole PR agency. You know, it's like a really successful PR agency. And they kind of attribute a chunk of it to, to using crystal profiles before. So that's pretty cool. I like seeing that kind of stuff. Um, I also have like multiple customers. The cool thing about when, when crystal works, it just wins over believers and then they champion it internally and they start trying to like throw it at everybody, which is pretty cool to see when that happens. So that's happened with a lot of our enterprise type sales leaders and folks. Um, yeah, I just got breakfast with another client of ours where that was the case. Um, yeah, he, he, he had closed the deal really early on. So with, with crystal as like the, the key asset that they had used in the process. So yeah, there's a lot of stories like that. There's also folks at large companies who have kind of made their careers, accelerated their careers by being the crystal person. Um, so they, they kind of wow. use the profiles and they, they're like this point of contact where people ask them for insights about people. There's like entire departments that have been built on, on crystals data. Wow. And that's, and that's, that's really, crazy. that's really cool to see. And those are usually massive companies where there's like an entire dedicated team of, you know, uh, customer insights type people. But yeah. I love seeing that as well. Well, and so I've seen it. So I could relate a real world story, story, two, two real world stories that, that, that are relevant to, to exactly what crystal does. Right. So like, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of when I was a buyer, went, went to go buy a car. I'm more of a high D, you know, mm -hmm. uh, high D I is what, is what I am. High D lowercase I, right. Which is like, I'm, I'm more, and this is it for you. This is for you, the listener, right. I'm, I'm yeah. more of like a extrovert, right. But more direct. Um, and, uh, that's like a really, really brief summary over, oversimplified. Yeah. Right. And the person that was trying to sell me the car was like a high, high C I could tell. And so with, with the, maybe a really low I. So he was just crushing me with details. And I just wanted the executive summary, right? I didn't want every single detail about every single engine part. And this guy was going through this. I was ready to like jump out of the car while it was moving, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and that's because of the way he was communicating with me. So like, and I've seen it with, with salespeople that will keep talking and talking and a person just wants the high level. And I've seen the other way too, where someone wants all the detail and those give them high level and then they won't trust them, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen that many times. So. Um, the other time it really where it comes down to car dealerships, like the differences in sales styles, I feel like that's just, you, you see the extremes. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've seen it across every, every sales org, um, yeah. that I've worked in, you know, um, I don't know. And then the other side of it, and this is why I think like I'm a big advocate of your solution is because like I had an example where I had two sales reps, right. On my team, one was like a hard grinder did every single activity he was supposed to, crushed his activity numbers, did all that, right? But his number consistently, but hit maybe 105% of his number, hit 100% of his number, maybe he was 90% that year. And then there was another member on my team. Um, and basically what she did is she dug deep into the emotional components throughout mm -hmm. the sales, right? So basically her pipeline was maybe half of what his was, but yet she had 130% of the results because she focused on the emotional component and he didn't at all, right? And so I think that's a segue of, of what your solution does is it allows you to communicate and work with people how they, they, they wanna be worked with and understand, understood, I should say. And so like, I, I can see the massive value, but does that make sense? Oh, excuse me. Bless you, man. Um, that's, a, that's a pattern I see across I'll typically ask when we're talking to sales leaders, like who, who are like the top performing reps and what are their disc types? Because, you know, often talking to sales leaders who like are already using disc and it's really funny. I didn't, I would never expect it, but I, I repeatedly get the answer that most of the people in like that top bracket are indeed like high D high I, but the top rep is always an S and it's, it's, it's always someone who's got that much more like empathetic, kind of quiet um come out of nowhere but really consistent um it seems like everyone every sales leader i talk to their their top rep is this person who's just like an out it seems they seem like an outlier in their team and everyone know, doesn't know what how they're doing it because they don't talk that much um yeah Always oh really so you had like i haven't seen that as much in my personal experience are these with bigger companies uh yeah i mean not with like massive companies, but a lot of our, yeah, our customers, I'll, I'll ask them about it. Um, but it's, it's funny cause it's, it's, it's usually a minority of people. Cause you generally, if you have that type of personality, you're not in sales in the first place. Um, so you're kind of a, an outlier already. 
Um, and who knows, that might be, I, I, I don't know why. Maybe it's just refreshing for customers since they're used to like hard charging salespeople when someone comes in <laughs> with like a pretty, you know, chill demeanor. It uh, their guard down a little more. Um, probably depends on the industry too. Interesting. Okay. Well, we're just about up on time, but I want, I want to ask you a, a question about AI. You mentioned it earlier on. And so like, I guess like, how are you leveraging AI in your business today? Right. <laughs> Everything from like product to market to sales, market to sales, to leadership, like how are you leveraging it? Any great tools that you're leveraging outside of your own? Um, we'd just love to hear your feedback on that. Um, I use, I mean, I use chat GPT for, a few things throughout my day. Um, lately it's been, um, content customization. So we've got a lot of parts of our product and also in our collateral, like marketing wise, where we need to take a piece of content, whether that's like a sales pitch or a negotiation tactic or, or something like that. And we need to split it up many different ways across like industries, disc types or whatever. And it's like a very repetitive work around mm -hmm. like writing. So this is historically a pretty, pretty heavy writing project. Um, so I've been using ChatGPT to generate essentially the drafts for me of these things. And it, it gets me like 80% of the way there. So I'll then play like the editor role in yeah. editing them down. So a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the writing work I've been kind of using it as an assistant to do it um, with mixed results, but I'm learning, learning to make it better. Um, probably my best thing that I've done so far is I've been combining pictures of two people on on the journey and I'll, I'll just randomly throughout the day, send out like, you know, like here's my VP of sales mixed with my director <laughs> of customer success. And this is what you are. This is what you look like. It's really fun. That's probably been my favorite application of these new AI tools so far. So your, your favorite application is creating love children from two people that work in your organization and then it's sending exactly. it to Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So I will, so I could, I could share in your passion for that. Cause I can't remember. I did that. You now they're like, Oh, create a, a picture, an avatar of your, uh, your two favorite customers, your, your, of your picture of what your favorite customer looks like, right. And who you want to serve and what they look mm -hmm. like. And, and so I'm like, all right, well, I, I love working with these two people. So I'm going to just, mm -hmm. I'm going to combine it and make a baby from them. Mm -hmm. And there was like an app that did that. Yeah. And I was like, crying just because of like oh, like yeah. sometimes how hideous they make the combination look but how how true it is when you see them side by side so that's awesome so i didn't even know that's a that's a great use case take two people combine them you know have you done like biden and trump together and see what that looks like anything like that i haven't or... tried that yet mostly it's just been people i know which is okay. more, than enough, more than enough entertainment for me <laughs> <laughs> i love that man how do you think, is your team using it a lot or what are you seeing across the rest of the organization? Our, some of our engineers are using it. Um, and I think we've been testing out, you know, I haven't really had like a, a whole round table about it with the business side. Um, we're on the, on the engineering side, we're definitely like using it to try to automate some things and some, um, I think uh, it's particularly useful, useful around writing tests that, that tends to be a really good use case for it. Um, and then just like researching things as how, as far as how to do things. So I think that's been, that's been common. I haven't seen much on the business side yet as far as how we're using it. Okay. Yeah. That was one of the things like, it was pretty cool. I, um, I've been spending a lot of time on it, like dedicating daily time to it. Cause I think that's how big of an impact it is, but I'm finding use cases where things just take like, like as a revenue leader it would take you an hour or mm -hmm. I should say a day to do, and I'm getting it done in like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It's it's pretty impactful. Um, all right, Matt. Well, Drew, it was awesome having you on the show. Appreciate your perspective and and kind of what you're working on. Like I said, big believer in disk and Matt. So I think it's cool that you could automate a lot of that through what you're doing, um, and then help people leverage it and and create revenue from it. So where can people find you? Where can they find out more about Crystal? And then we'll wrap things up, man. They can just Google Crystal Knows or go to crystalnose.com. And the only social network that I'm really on is LinkedIn. So <laughs> just on there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on the show, Drew. It was a pleasure having you, man. All right. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Cheers.